Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back to Cyber House Party. And this session is specifically around cyber stress. What does it mean? What does it look like? What does it feel like? And uh, most importantly, what can we do to uh, to address it? And is there a time, an appropriate time to, to reset the expectations on the security function? I'm really pleased to welcome our guests here today. First of all, we've got Alan Jenkins, Senior Cyber Security Advisor and CISO in Residence at Cylon. We've got Amar Singh, CEO and founder of Cyber Management Alliance. Catherine Turpak, Senior Cyber Security Education and Culture Specialist, I think, at Jaguar Land Rover. Big, uh, big mouthful there. And Mark Nichols, CISO at the Chime Group. Welcome, people. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Mark. Um, so, first of all, let's talk about what we what we think <clears throat> this problem is. Is it just a concept? Is it a myth? You know, we hear a lot about CISO burnout. We hear a lot about uh, senior lead, senior cyber leader burnout, stress. Um, it's a tough time uh, for anybody in this industry. But is it particularly bad now? Um, we've heard recently, you know, um, senior people within big organisations blaming the junior uh, members of staff for, for weaknesses in their own governance. Um, is that typical of what we see? We've had a massive surge in digital transformation over the last 12 months. Uh, what does that look like and feel like? We've got a massive uh, skills shortage in the cyber industry as well. So all of those things are banded around as causing uh, stress, pressure, anxiety. Um, is it true? What does it look like? Alan, first of all, can I come to you on that question, please? Well, I think first off, I think we have to face the fact that it is real. Um, but I think that stress is both felt at an individual, but also at the organizational level, whether that's your security team or indeed the wider business. So I think pretending that it doesn't exist, you're in the wrong place. Um, some people thrive in it, others don't. Um, but we have to think about the collective, because whilst I'm actually quite comfortable with stress, you know, I, I, I to some extent, I like the chaos that goes with an incident because it gives you an opportunity to make a difference. Not everybody does thrive. So you have to know your team. You have to know the wider organization. You know, and as a, as a leader, I have to be the still small voice of calm, the measured voice within the, within the room. But also your role is about coordination, the activities of everybody. You know, and much of it is actually about communication. But you've got to think about the people. And I think something that um, has become most apparent over the last 12 months is the need for team ethics, for, for team work. And to throw the intern under the bus like that was abhorrent, frankly. Brilliant. Thank you, Alan. Um, Mark, uh, what's your experience and uh, you know, what do you think about this question? I, do, I totally agree with Alan. The, the stress is real. I mean, personally, I've had some bad incidents. One I recall, I was heading up security for University of Westminster, which, as you may know, back in 2015, uh, Jihadi John was world's number one terrorist and was unmasked as a, an alumni of the University of Westminster. Now, when we learned to that, we were doing everything we can as a security team to, to protect the information that we held on the individual because we knew at the time things like the student photograph would uh, command a high price in media because the only photographs around were pictures of that so the first picture of him we believe our media lawyers were talking six figures for that and we thought we'd done everything to protect it but then unfortunately on the four o'clock sky news briefing there was a picture for including his full student record and i took it incredibly personally i thought you know i've done a rubbish job here i've failed um i didn't sleep for for probably two or three days why i tried to find out who was responsible for this incident who had leaked that information and I think the the point I want to make around this is security is probably one of the, actually it probably is the only job I know of that you, you're you going to have a failure. It doesn't matter what you do, it's, there is going to be a failure at some point in controls, in processes, something's going to go wrong. And I think as security people, if we can come to terms with that and accept that, um, which is hard to do, I appreciate it is, then it might ease some of the stress levels, but we're so passionate about doing the right thing. Everyone I've met in security have a huge drive and passion about doing the right thing and their, their morals are outstanding. Um, and I think that's some of the reason why we, we take it so badly when things do go wrong. Uh, Amar, can I come to you now, please? Hey, greetings, everyone. Yep. Um, so we are resident uh, trusted advisors in many organisations also. And I can give you a few examples, very quick ones. Um, 
one, I get asked the question, are we secure? Which starts with the problem because the, instead of asking, are we breach ready, for example, um, we, we also do, we are specialists in crisis management, incident response, and we speak to a lot of, I speak directly with one-on-one -on -one with CEOs. One of them, very large organization said, Amar, I have a zero tolerance to incidents. <laughs> so you can see where this is going, right? So if, if there's zero tolerance, and I mean, the other one, which is, I'm sure you've heard of it before, uh, Alan and uh, Mark and, you know, Catherine, I mean, I've been a CISO myself. And another acronym for CSO is Chief Blame Officer, right? Um, it, th those are the facts that we can't run away from. We are trying to, but the problem is it requires a, a change in the thinking, change in asking the right questions rather than saying, am I secure? Because if, if you say yes and you get hacked tomorrow, kiss, you know, kiss goodbye to your job. If you say no and you get hacked tomorrow, you still have to kiss goodbye to the job, right? So it puts... The, the culture, the thought process, how can you have a zero tolerance to cyber attacks, right? And, and if this is a message, for example, in an organization that is coming right from the top, you can imagine the pressure on the, not just the CISO, but anyone. Because I mean, most cyber attacks are misconfigured. They start somewhere with a misconfiguration, right? A human making a mistake or not being trained properly etc right and unless unless the message from the top comes things are going to happen let's be breach ready let's be more prepared then the whole organization is under living under the sphere of i cannot have a cyber attack okay thank you mark uh Catherine, if i can come to you now i mean working in kind of security education and looking at that security culture within the organization um do you see the stress do you see the the, the impact of that yeah, massively. I think, um, you know, a lot of it comes down to psychology of a human being at the end of the day. Um, you're trying to handle however many end users within an organisation. And despite, you know, the best laid plans, things aren't always going to go right. People are, you know, they're not going to write the right passwords or they're going to write them down or they're going to stick something in their computer that they weren't supposed to stick in their computer, or they're going to click on a phishing email. And this is all just down to psychology. Um, there's something um, that Daniel Kahneman, and a behavioral economic, economist, talks about, which is system one versus system two thinking. So as humans, we're stuck in system one thinking, where you've got heuristics, which is like a shortcut for your brain. Now, we live in that way because it makes everything a lot easier for us it makes it easier to get around do things you know we, we're just living on shortcuts and and autopilot and that stress um as as the other guys have talked about you're relying all an organization is putting all of the weight and responsibility into one team for the whole organization Thank you for that, Catherine. Um, Mark, if I can come back to you um, now, please. I, I wanted to pick up on something that you mentioned, which is, which I think is really, really key. And that is the fact that, generally speaking, um, particularly everybody I know in the industry is really helpful and, and willing to do the right thing. You know, we're there to defend against the attackers and we're just a helpful bunch. Is, is it is that part of the reason why we potentially we may take on too much responsibility and not and not disseminate through that throughout the business as Catherine was talking about there? I, I think it is. I mean, we we embrace new challenges with open arms, and and as you said, the majority of the people working in the industry want to do the right thing, and if that means picking up other areas of the business to to strive towards that that goal of making sure that we can be secure as, as possible and enable the business to continue operations because in reality, that's what happens. If security fails, the business ceases operations, whether that's due to a cyber attack, if there's a, a breach that has an impact on revenues or something that affects customer confidence. So if I, if I use an example in one of my previous roles, there was a gap in general information management. We recognize that information security comes from good information management as well as regulatory compliance and data quality and all those other wonderful things so i took that with open arms it was probably the wrong thing to do because it was just adding more to my workload and, and more things to do but what it enabled me was to increase probably the visibility of the security team because we could 
talk about information management, which in some respects has a slightly wider reach across across a business, certainly if it's a, a data-driven business and certainly one with lots of customers. And we could do things like get uh, responsibilities into all director level roles. There are 130 directors across the business and we put information management into that. And as a consequence, responsibility around security, um, data quality and, and regulatory compliance. So I think it's the reason we take on that responsibility, rightly or wrongly, is, is because we want to drive things forward. We want to, to impact change across the organisation and we will use what tools they may be rightly or wrongly whether it's our responsibility or not yeah okay thank you um alan we've seen um uh, many images uh, and people have attempted to write down all of the security functions responsibilities onto a single page it was a it was a big page um you know is that is that not a sign that we're taking too much on yes but but i think it's a good um it's a good illustration of where security touches all parts of the business. You know, I, I, when I'm talking about security, I do a um, visiting lecture once a year to University of Manchester. And, and I talk about the value chain developed by Professor Michael Porter in Harvard. Security doesn't feature in the value chain, despite the fact health and safety and quality management do. And I think that's better part of our problem. But I, I, if I may, Mark, uh, I, I like where both Mark and Catherine are going, because I think there's something about the psychology of, of our profession, and I have seen it in the broader security, not just in cyber as well. It's almost a vocation. You've got to be passionate. There are very few successful people in our business who just do nine to five. And that, I think, is a both a good thing, but it also sets us up for increased stress because we want to do the right thing. We want to do it professionally, properly, dot the I's and cross the T's. But I think in the fast moving dynamic of a business, um, particularly one that might be under pressure from a cash flow basis, i.e. a business pressure, or particularly when it's the wrong side of an incident, that's not necessarily the best approach for the individual or indeed for the collective. Because that striving for a you know, zero, zero breach, zero attack piece is just entirely the wrong place. And you know, that, that sets you up to fail. And I think both Amar and, and Mark made that point. But Catherine's point about psychology, I think we need to look after ourselves individually and collectively, but recognize that actually we quite enjoy putting out fires. I try and use the sweeper analogy from a football team, a soccer team. You know, you're just in front of the, in front of the defence. You, know, you could call that first line of defence, not just security. That could be network operations, infrastructure, etc. And you're sitting in front, making sure they're working in the right direction, and then linking up with the midfield and the attackers, who frankly are only interested in scoring goals. By which, of course, the analogy is that's business, and they're only interested in profit. And Mark, if I could come on to you on uh, on, on that point, there really. So you know, looking at those responsibilities, Alan talked about the fact that it's a good representation of all of the responsibilities or, or the security aspects which should be covered in organizations. How do we disseminate that responsibility? How do we actually make it effective? Well, I mean, multiple things. I think the business needs to understand what they want from the CISO. Uh, that's one point. Uh, I can be very fussy with words. I think the CISO title, I know some people say title means nothing, but actually title means a lot of things, right? You can't call the CEO the sweeper, can you, right? Um, and I mean, you can't say to HR, oh, you buy now, by the way, you also need to know sales, right? You also need to know how the marketing works. HR does a specific job, right? And so do marketing folks do a specific job. But if you look at what's on the internet, and I'm not going to take names because it's not aimed at an individual, but the reality is if you look at what is expected from the CISO, he or she needs to know all. They need to be the master of all topics. Forget about jack of all aces, right? And if you look at some of the mind maps that are floating around, my opinion, I would burn that mind map straight out because you cannot expect one person to know every single thing. And, and it goes back to what I, if I'm the CEO, I need to know what I want from the CISO. Because if I think the CISO is just going to protect me from all attacks, that's a very bad job description. 
And, and then we have the whole headache of job descriptions. There are so many examples on LinkedIn where, I mean, Kubernetes has been around for five years and they won 15 years experience, you know, for Kubernetes and, and devs and, and even the CISO is basically expected to have all knowledge. Oh, he or she must be technical, but he or she must be able to speak to business. They blah, 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 blah. You know, they need governance experience. They need risk. Get, get, get the fact, what do you want from, you know, the CISO and I mean, one, if I may very quickly, one example I like to give is if you look at the internal audit functions in large organizations, right? They themselves are under massive pressure, but they actually have specialities, right? So the one auditor doesn't need to know everything because they're not expected to be the masters of all domains, right? You have an IT auditor, you have a business auditor, and the same approach I think must be given where possible to the CISO, it must be run as a proper department with the necessary support. And I think like we were discussing in one of our prep sessions, you know, should the CISO, and Catherine, maybe this may now be a segue to you, I think, Mark, but should the CISO, you know, look after awareness, right? Or, or why should the CISO look after awareness is what I would say. Appreciate that, you know, organizations of different shapes and sizes, um, uh, you know, have an impact on how you can get the right level of responsibility and awareness and, and share that burden, if you like, amongst all of your organization. But your experience, you know, what was the best way of achieving that? What, what things work? You know, if people are listening uh, to this session now. What should they take away for their organization? What type of activities work in terms of, of sharing that responsibility and what don't? In my experience, um, a, a strong, robust ambassador program hits the mark every time. So you, if you think about the ambassador program, like the capillaries in the body, like you can get to every inch of, of every part of the organization um, with those ambassadors sitting in, in situ. The only problem you have from a political standpoint um, is who pays for their time when they're off doing training or or you know if they're dealing with an incident on their team and they're trying to help one of their teammates access the right kind of help or support or that they're, they're delivering those takeaways to the team it's kind of um a, a bit of an arguable point about well whose who's budget whose bottom lines is coming off um, and i've seen that in previous organizations where ambassador programs took a long time to get off the ground mm -hmm. because of everyone arguing about who pays for those people yeah. we talk about the the fact that we're always defending it's a really difficult industry to celebrate our successes in and so um i think on the on the flip side of all of this you know looking at the positives really has to to help and and you know to Catherine's point you know um looking at people as individuals asking them to help us and rewarding them appropriately to talk to infuse them to do that so Mark, what have you seen that works really well in terms of celebrating uh, successes within within the uh, security responsibilities or security culture of an organization? Well, build, building on what Catherine said, so building a um, security champions network so effectively people in the business, this isn't their role, it's a secondary skill they take on to champion security around the business and then make a song and dance about it on, on the internet when they do a good thing. Oh, we spotted the latest phishing email that's come in. We've educated our peers. We've prevented a, a major attack. Celebrate that, tell people about it. We've got to shout about it when things things go right. And, and just building on that point, I think also making sure security teams are, um, are built from diversely skilled people. I mean, Amar talked about these job descriptions that list everything and every, anything for me, let's hire, hire for people's skills and attitude. If you can talk to people and build that strongest link within your organization based on, on people's skills, then that's gonna go, go a long way. Yeah, look, I, I think we've got to reward good behavior, not punish bad. Um, you know, that doesn't mean to say you don't punish bad behavior, but I, I think security you know, all too often is seen in the punishment space. Um, and, and one of the one of the sea change moments for me was when I was running a security awareness campaign more than ten years ago now, and we opted to reward clear desk policy, not punish those who didn't have a clear desk, but to put a red balloon, go see reception, security would be waiting there, and we rewarded them with chocolate. That was a real counterculture moment on a, on a number of levels. One, that you know that wasn't what people were expecting from security. Um, 
there were people then arguing as to why they didn't get a red balloon because they thought their desk was clear. Um, and we ended up with a conversation going on with people off the back of that, because up to that point, they'd been frightened to talk to security. Yeah, we've got to celebrate successes, whether it's at the individual leader level or the team level. We need to do it better than we do today. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Amar, just come to you then on, uh, on some final thoughts around that. I mean, if, if we were allowed to do case studies, we would probably have 100 case studies today. <laughs> Right. And that is part of the problem. You know, there are so many good things happening, but the organizations, the PR teams. And again, I would say it's a difficult balance because if you shout out too loud, I'm secure. You know, we've done a great job. You are literally going red rag, red rag, <laughs> look here. Right. It's a really difficult balance. I, I kid you not, because I was sitting with my business, uh, uh, this thing and 100 case studies at least. And I, uh, you know, but we don't have 100 case studies because nobody wants to go on record. No, and yes, you need internal recognition, absolutely, like Mark and the others are saying. It is a psychology thing, but you know what? People need a pat on the back. People need to be recognized for things happen. And go, I go back to that zero tolerance policy, uh, Mark. The CEO, dare I say, the board, the executives have got to come out saying, you can't just say zero tolerance because you're setting the scene for failure, yeah. right? You've got to say, Okay, let's be breach ready. We know things happen. Let's all we are in it together. Okay. Thank you, Omar. And um, Catherine, some final closing comments from yourself, just to bring it back to, to, to the relief of the stress, the relief of the anxiety, the pressure on the security function, thinking about personal and operational resilience. From your position as security education and culture lead, you know, um, final thoughts from your end, celebrating successes and, and, and um, you know, making sure that we've embedded security properly. Yeah, I think um, a large portion of it, believing that stress does come down to initiatives like ambassador programmes or, or champion programmes, however you want to kind of look at them. Um, I think that that just takes the pressure off the main core security team disseminates that across the organization you end up with a cultural shift but i don't think that the the whole responsibility and like amar said there that zero tolerance um i don't think that's that's a good mindset for an organization to have um i can't for the life of me remember his name but the head of the fbi said whoever doesn't get breached now will be breached um it's just a fact of life every organization is going to have a cyber attack at some point um, and i don't think it's fair for for the security team to to hold that burden um, and get bogged down with it we've got a million and one things we want to do already we're very passionate about what we do some of the most passionate people i've ever met in my life work in security um and you know you don't want to put that exact that that pressure and that stress onto those people or as they already are. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, so look, guys, it's a it's a big problem. Uh, we've admitted that. Um, we're not intending to solve it all quickly, but um, your advice, your 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 thoughts around how we can help just a little bit is really appreciated. Um, we want to keep the conversation going. You know, please get in touch if you if you've got any concerns about anything that's been said. Any further advice from these wonderful people? By all means, just get in touch. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody for participating. Thank you for watching and listening and look after yourselves and we'll speak to you soon. Thank you.